So how can we know what was being said in those logging camps before Bunyan's stories were put to print? It's because of these four people and what they did. I've read you some excerpts from Bartlett's papers. He published this book on the history of the Chippewa Valley at his own expense in the 20s, but he left out most of the Bunyan stories he collected. Those are still in his manuscripts up in Eau Claire. The first person to start collecting aggressively was Charles Brown, who was at the Wisconsin Historical Society Museum. And in 1906, he started interviewing loggers to collect their folklore. Uh, in 1922, he issued a little pamphlet here, about six pages of Bunyan's stories, which was one of the first printed. Then during World War I, Bernice Stewart, who was an undergraduate, who was an undergraduate at UW and had grown up up north, decided for an English class she would collect some of these stories and they would be the, the focus of a paper. And her, her <coughs> English professor encouraged her to do that. And together they ended up publishing the first collection taken from the mouths of lumberjacks in 1917. And their papers, their unpublished papers, the unpublished papers of these four people is where the evidence is for the origins of Paul Bunyan. By the way, she's not wearing a hat like the, the Wicked Witch of the West. That's in the background. She's wearing a sombrero right there. She was a very stylish, modern woman. But most Americans never heard about these Wisconsin Bunyan stories. Others made it into the press first, as we'll see in a minute. But the stories in the book are these early ones, and maybe we should look at some of those. There are about a hundred of these in the book taken from the oral tradition. <clears throat> At Paul Bunyan's Big Onion River Camp in section 37, anybody pick up on that? How many sections in the township? 36. Okay, so if you just were a new farm kid or a new immigrant, you wouldn't realize you, your leg was being pulled. Everybody else in the bunkhouse would understand your leg was being pulled. In section 37, there was a 40-acre tract of land shaped like a pyramid. It had a heavy growth of pine on all of its four sides. It was so very high that to see to its peak took a week of steady looking. It required 20 men, each looking as far as he could, just to do this. Several men got blind, just trying to see halfway up. <laughs> Paul and his crew of 2,000 men worked a whole winter clearing this 40. From it, he cut 100 million feet of timber. Some of the men got one short leg from working on the steep slope all winter. They used to sharpen their axe blades by holding them on boulders, which they rolled downhill. The slope was so steep that the upland grouse laid square eggs to keep them rolling out of their nests. OK, you get the idea. Now, there's a joke. There's an inside joke here going on. When a lumber company bought a 40 acre section, um, they were entitled to cut however many trees were within the bounds of the 40 acres. But they so often would take trees from the adjacent territory that there were jokes in lumber companies about round 40s. And the only way to explain how Paul Bunyan could get so much lumber off a single 40 was to make it a pyramid. And then there'd be many, many more trees on it. Another joke going on here in the, um, the illustration is that it's on Round River. And you saw from the earlier photos, they would cut down the trees and they'd float them down the river to a lumber mill. And a lot of the early Bunyan stories told aloud concerned a Round River with no outlet. <laughs> and Paul came back years later and found his crew just still going round and round. And so there are bunches of stories about the Round River. As you can see, those kinds of stories are really clever. They, uh, they're like Mark Twain in their irony. They're, they're like Lewis Carroll and um, Alice's Adventures in Wonderland in the way they play with logical contradictions. So here you have these people, lumberjacks, many of them have no education at all, and they're out there playing with how we conceive reality. It's wonderful. It was so cold, words froze right in the air. All winter long, the weather remained that way. If you said hello, you'd see it hanging in the air. If a teamster swore at his oxen, the sound of his voice would freeze also. That spring when the thaw came, you could see all those oaths thaw out the same day. Never in all history since the beginning of man was a more terrible barrage of profanity thrown over it than there was that spring on the little onion. One particularly snappy day, Big Joe set the boiling coffee pot on the stove, and it froze up so quick that the ice was hot. 
One of the crew was kept busy that year picking up the ears and noses that froze and dropped off the loggers and threatened to tie up the traffic on the tote roads. Even warm weather had its dangers. The mosquitoes near Paul Bunyan's camps were so large that they could put their hind legs on one side of the stream, their forelegs on the other, and just pick the loggers off as they went by. If you've been up north in Mayor June, you've seen these, right? Well, Bunyan tried to come up with a solution for that. He learned of the existence of a particularly large and ferocious race of bumblebees, and he sent his camp cook to secure a lot of them and drive them to camp. The domesticated bumblebees were as large and formidable as he expected them to be, and when released, they immediately attacked and bested the mosquito tribe. All went well for a while, until some of his bees entered into friendly relations with and intermarried with the mosquitoes. The result was a cross which was more powerful and bloodthirsty than ever because of having a stinger at each end. Before we go to how Paul Bunyan became famous, there were um, <clears throat> hundreds of those stories told aloud, generally improvised on the spot in logging camps. There was no sort of canon, no official set of stories like the Knights of the Round Table stories. Or whatever, because people made them up as they went along. One person would start, and seeing that the newcomers were being taken in, another person would pitch in. So when the lumberjacks told them, the creator of the story, and the audience for the story were the same people. And in these stories, Bunyan is generally the lumberjack or the head of a crew. He's one of them. And when he can get out of a massive log jam or solve all sorts of problems, it's a way that they themselves could imagine dealing with these horrible working conditions. Once Bunyan leaves the oral tradition and starts to get printed, all that changes. And the loggers lose control of this representation of themselves. The first mention of Paul Bunyan in print is that little article on the left from 1904 in Duluth. It's a gossip column caught on the run. It was in, uh, in every newspaper, every issue of the newspaper. And this one is about the decline of logging. Because by 1904, a lot of logging companies are moving further west to Washington and Oregon. And the decline of the lumberjack. In the third paragraph there, it, his pet joke and the one with which the greenhorn at camp is sure to be tried consists of a series of imaginative tales about, I can't read it at this angle, <laughs> about, the year. about the year Paul Bunyan lumbered in North Dakota, and then summarizes some of the stories. Mm -hmm. the, the picture on the right is the first time that Bunyan makes it to a national audience. That's an article published in 1910 in Milwaukee, in a magazine sort of like Field and Stream. It was called Outer's Book, and it was a hunting, fishing, camping kind of magazine. It went all over the country. And this uh, journalist from Minnesota named Rockwell tells um, 10 or 20 of the stories in this article, sort of the way I have been reading them. He also talks about Gene Shepard and having interviewed Gene Shepard in the Hodag Hoax. And so there's a little more evidence there that maybe Bunyan was, um, that Shepard was connected to the origin of Bunyan. Now this went nationwide and died. Nobody cared. Nobody got it. It was reprinted in Madison in the State Journal, and it was reprinted in Washington, D.C. in the Washington Post. Nobody was very interested. In 1910, American culture was thrilled by Europe. It was Henry James and Edith Wharton, and who cared what lumberjacks were saying? That changed. In 1914, the first Bunyan book appears. It's actually a little pamphlet, that image on the right, made by the guy on the left, William Lawpett. Lophead um, was a cousin of the head of the Red River Lumber Company in Minneapolis. Um, Archie Walker was his name. Anybody been to the Walker Gallery in the Twin Cities in St. Paul? Okay, same family. Archie Walker's money from this founds that gallery, that art gallery. So um, at this point in time, 1914, the company is expanding. They're, they've bought forests in California. They're shipping lumber to the east. And so they want an icon. They want some brand, some, um, some kind of image that says big. So Archie Walker says to Lafayette, you've heard some of these Bunyan stories. Let's use those. And in the company catalog, which is the other image there on the right, it's really about three by five inches, a little, little catalog of products. There's a Bunyan story in, on every other page. The facing pages are about um, how much two by fours cost and what the company is. And they sent this to all their customers for free. 
And they thought, great, everybody will get it. No one got it. Even the people who ran lumber yards had never heard of Paul Bunyan in 1914. And the advertising campaign totally flopped. But Walker and Loft had liked their idea. And all during World War I, they used Bunyan and made up these stories to promote their lumber. 